So the date is February 10th at 10, 11 a.m. I'm Catherine Ducey, and the other people in the room are Rachel Lane and Dr. Carl Huther. And Dr. Fritz Casey Leininger. Okay, so our first question is, can you describe the main teaching methods you used and how you felt about them, as well as how your teaching changed over time? And then I guess a uh, like follow-up is, you mentioned the horrible teaching model of the professor just being a lecturer. Who knows, like who knows everything, and then how do you see the, how do you feel the teaching model affected the students? I think the teaching models have affected the students by and large pretty negatively, and I think it probably still does. Uh, the lecture model has been around for an awful lot of ever since the, the uh, institutes of higher education came into existence. But um, I think it was particularly valid in the 60s and 70s. Uh, certainly, uh, the training that I had as a grad student for preparation for being an assistant professor was essentially zero in terms of teaching. The entire emphasis for my five years of graduate work were, was on uh, research. I did a master's degree at, at NC State on quantitative genetics. I uh, did not teach five minutes that, for that two-year master's. I was out uh, on a fellowship at, uh, for my PhD at uh, Davis, California. And only the last quarter that I was there, I volunteered to be a, a TA in a genetics class just to have some sense. And so with nothing more than that, I came to the institution and was teaching three classes the first quarter. Uh, just unbelievably crazy and it's still amazing to me today that we do so little in preparing uh, students for a faculty position. We have a program called Preparing Future Faculty here that's been in existence at UC for about 20 years. Most institutions don't have one, but we do, and uh, it's a fantastic program, except that very few, relatively speaking, very few graduate students take advantage. There might be 20 certificates per year that are uh, provided through the training of that program, and we graduate maybe, I don't know, hundreds of graduate students, so uh, the percentage is quite small. So uh, I would say in the last 20 years, we've done a lot better in many classes. Uh, and we have, are doing that because we have an organization called the Academy of Fellows for Teaching and Learning, uh, which is dedicated to improving teaching. We have the Center for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning. And that, too, uh, is committed to improving uh, teaching. And there are more and more models where it's, it's an exchange of ideas among the students and faculty member rather than what we're doing now, which is just, you know, the equivalent of a lecture. So I'll stop. Okay. <laughs> is this the kind of thing you're looking for? I mean, can we dialogue or you're just going to yeah. sit and, um, and well, listen? I will ask you, um, you mentioned the PRS system. And you said that um, it was brought in like a decade before you retired, uh, and it fundamentally changed how you taught. So it was like a mini lecture, like you said, how it was a, sort of like an exchange of ideas between students. And I think that's interesting because we like still use it now. And like, in my freshman bio class, we used that. We like created groups. So did you feel that that like definitely helped change like the dynamic of the classrooms? Absolutely, changed the dynamics enormously because it got the students actively involved. Some students don't like it yet to this day, but it's a wonderful opportunity for student engagement. Did you have Dr. Uh, Brian Kinkle? Yes, for, I did. You did, and he used it pretty regularly, yes. and he got you into small groups. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a wonderful model. I don't know whether history does it. I we, have, we do that a lot also. Do you? Yeah. That's great. Uh, well, you, have you had it too, Kate? Um, I don't have any experience with it, but my friend is a nursing major and she always talked about it. So. Yeah. 
So it's developed, the idea that I created out of it was a mini model of lecturing, maybe 10 minutes or so, where try to get a one or two major points across and then ask a couple of questions through the personal response system. And if the students got 75, 80% of them were, were on board, then we simply went on. If 40% of it uh, didn't understand it, then I'd say, okay, break into your groups, talk about it, and come up with the right answer. And that was students teaching other students. And, and it wasn't just a matter that one student would say, listen, you dummies, the answer is D, forget it, and, and I'll tell them. Uh, but it really was a matter of what, what, what does this mean? And someone would explain it, and maybe sometimes they'd get it wrong. Some groups would, would be clueless at the end, but then we would have someone explain what, what the uh, answer was. So I think it's a terrific model. Uh, do, you, do, do you have any idea what percentage of classes use it today? I think most of us in the history department use some version of, you know, combining lecture and small group, uh, small group work. Um, I think very few history faculty do a straight ahead, just straight lectures anymore. Um, but you're right, that's how I was, I, you know, I came to graduate school. Uh, my first teaching experience was a, um, a summer course, three and a third weeks, cram everything that you'd usually teach in a quarter into three and a third weeks, and no one gave me any training. It's like thrown off the deep end, swim, good luck. Yeah, yeah it's that old model that as long as you know your subject, you should be able to convey all of the appropriate information to students. And, and it's a model that, by and large, has not worked. And I, I'm really appalled that institutes of higher ed haven't understood the value of a different kind of teaching model, getting a much better handle on how students learn. Um, so besides the PRS, what were other things that changed while you were at the university? So like the, um, by the student body, the faculty, the community relationships, the physical changes? Well, um, I guess one thing is that we went from a municipal institution of maybe 15 or 20,000 to a state institution of now 45,000. So that was a substantial difference. Our classes got much bigger. Uh, I did not feel nearly as good about the relationships I had with students uh, over the last 20 years compared to my first 20 years. Uh, we had uh, class sizes of 25, 35, maybe 40, uh, which were certainly reasonable and, and I could get the chance to really interact. Students were coming in much more regularly to see me, to talk with me, to ask questions about the materials, and genuinely trying to understand the material. Uh, the last 20 years I felt that was much, much less. Uh, now one problem was I was teaching classes of 50, 60, 70. 200, 300, so my, my, I was in different classes, but uh, the, the size, uh, I think, had a tremendously negative impact. And I could, you know, hours, I would be in my, my office hours, week after week after week, and not see a single suit. Did you go in to see Brian Kinkle? I did go in to see him a few times. A couple of times <laughs> during, the, during the semester. Yes. And of course, we were a 10-week quarter versus a 15-week semester. Thing. And you went in primarily to understand something or because there was some technical issue? Um, I went in actually, there was a project that we were doing a biology lab and I needed help with it, so I went in and asked him about it. Um, and then there was another time where I didn't understand something in the lecture, so I had to go in to talk to him about it. Good. Other classes did you go in as well? Um, for my chemistry classes, I've been in the office hours, but that's 
Jane? Um, my the classes I've been have been like smaller classes, so I didn't like go to a lot of office hours just because I could ask my teacher before or after class, just because like due to the class sizes. Okay. All right. So do we need to say more about that aspect? I don't know whether I'm answering your questions at all. <laughs> but I'm trying to get you guys to participate. I will say that I think it's a lot easier for us to communicate with our teachers outside of office hours because we can like quickly mm -hmm. shoot them an email or sometimes a text message. So we don't always need to go to the office hours, especially when it's nasty and cold outside like this and you don't want to get out of your room. Yeah, that's a good point, Rachel. Uh, I have to say, I don't really remember getting that many emails from students either once we, we came into the new modern era. Uh, but then, you know, I would say that the fundamental change was Blackboard. Mm -hmm. Blackboard allowed just a totally different concept. The idea that you could present your PowerPoint presentations to the students via Blackboard before class and that at least a reasonable number of students came into the class either with a copy of it or with the computer where they got it, uh, I think that was another fundamental change. So you could really get a lot of that information without having to write everything down. Do you remember when Blackboard League came into play at UC? Oh gosh. Really, at least Maybe. relative to when you retired? What would you guess, 1990, something like uh, that? No, it was, I, so I was in graduate school, I, got my doctorate in 93. The first email system we had was, the first time I remember using an email system here was 1995, and it was a very primitive mainframe kind of email. You all wouldn't have ever had to deal with it. It was awful. Uh, Blackboard, probably not until the late 90s. Late 90s. Yeah. I remember that makes sense. One year teaching once a week in a winter quarter, and I had we had and it was on Monday, and so I missed. We didn't have Martin Luther King Day, so we missed. And then the next week there was a snowstorm, and school was called off. So I didn't meet with the students for two weeks, and we didn't have email. So I think we, I met with the students, I might have met with the students twice. We had two weeks off because of the holiday and the snow, and then we picked up again. So it would have been the fifth week of class, halfway, almost halfway through the quarter. Um, and there was no way for me to contact the students. Mm. So you're probably right, maybe the late 90s, uh, and obviously PRS came in after that, although probably not a long time after. So the two fundamental technologic changes in, in my view, the ability to give the students the information outside of class and PRS. Uh, and we, we had a faculty member in the English department named Barbara Wolverd. Uh, she eventually left and went to Notre Dame. Uh, but uh, her model was to get the students to have most of the content outside of the uh, classroom and then just get into a conversation about material. She was happened to be teaching Shakespeare, so they would listen to all of their videos, etc., uh, outside of class. And that was a model that, that really, I think, is one that we should try to emulate, and, and we try to do it now. Because after all, getting the students to clarify their understanding of material in the classroom makes a whole lot more sense than sitting there and looking at a video. And so another thing we could do through Blackboard was to give not only our PowerPoints, but I would show video, provide videos for them as well through there. Uh, so those, those were transformational, I think, and uh, fundamentally different than the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, I remember I got my first Mac computer 
in uh, 82 or 83, little SE2 that wasn't worth a damn, but uh, that was the beginning of the, and then as Fritz says, uh, you, we didn't get in there for another 15 years or so easily. So how did like you see in the area around Cincinnati compare to where you were living in California? So like, what were some of the similarities, differences, like racism, gender roles, and class divisions? Say that again, Rachel. Um, like the differences between you see and where you lived around Cincinnati compared to where you, you were living in California. Okay, so Davis, California was a town of about 30,000 compared to 450 at that time here in Cincinnati. Cincinnati is now less than 300, but at that time it was uh, 450 to 500. And uh, Davis, California is, is now and was then a, uh, a university school with an enormous amount of biking. Uh, so we lived uh, in the town of Davis, but that was still only 10 minutes away. And, my standard routine would be to bike. Whereas here in Cincinnati, the first few years anyway, we lived 15 miles from campus, and so very different circumstances. Um, well, Davis, California, all of California compared to Ohio, you probably know. Uh, it, it, California has so much progress, progressive thinking and uh, 10 years later, it will come to, to uh, Ohio and to Cincinnati. Uh, what was it, Will Rogers saying that he wanted to be in Cincinnati when the earth came to an end because they were always 10 years later than, than any, any place else. And, and I think that was true then and unfortunately, by and large, it's true now. Even though Democrats control the, the council a lot more, there's still so much uh, conservatism So, um, sorry. <laughs> so when you returned to, oh. so return to Cincinnati after being in California for the 11 years, was there any reason that like, was there any reason that stuck out in your mind that made you glad to be back in Cincinnati? Uh, family relationships, almost exclusively. That's what brought us back. Our four parents were here. And uh, we have been away for that 11 years, not all in California, just three years in California. But um, sure, that was the biggest thing by far. Although I thought the University of Cincinnati was an exciting place. Uh, it was so much fun to be in a department of faculty with uh, 11 or 12 colleagues who fundamentally respected each other, work together. We used to have a little thing where if you had your door closed, you were working on your research or teaching, um, if a colleague could take his key and just tap on the door and that would immediately say, come on in, because that's the kind of <clears throat> relationship that was developed. Uh, I don't, the, the last 20 or 30 years was fundamentally different as we grew to a department of 25 members rather than 11 or 12, uh, all of that uh, closeness and camaraderie uh, dissipated, <clears throat> sadly, in, in my opinion. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if that got pretty to your question. No. Uh, <clears throat> that, yeah, that is a um, What is your favorite part, place, or memory of Cincinnati or UC? <laughs> Gee, I, I know I answered these questions before. <clears throat> um, well, I, again, I think relationships, faculty relationships, student relationship. I still keep in touch with a surprising number of grad students. I'm sure Fritz and most faculty members do the same way. So singularly, I would answer that as student and faculty camaraderie, social interactions, I mean, after all, that's an awful lot of what education's about, what the university's about, what life is about. Um, can you talk more about your involvement with, like, um, the programs that you see? I know you mentioned that you were, um, sorry, that you mentioned, like, you were um, 
the acting vice provost, the associate dean, and the director of honors in the McMakin College of Arts and Sciences. So would you just talk more about Sure. This? And it's nice because you're both in the honors program now. When I was the director, and let me go back and tell you that my recollection is the honors program started, I was at 74 to 77, a guy named Hal Fishbein ran it, 71 to 74, he was a faculty member in, in psychology, and then it was created with a fellow in physics named Bill Joyner, so I think he took it over in about, he, he created, or it was, it was created in 1968. I think that's correct. Um, and um, at that time, it was strictly an arts and sciences honors program, not a university-wide, and there might have been 60 to 80 members of the honors program. Uh, and when I was there from 74 to 77, I really wanted to expand it to a university base, and I'm happy to say I think we clearly moved it in that direction. But it was still small enough that we would have the honor students down to our home. We lived in Clifton at that point, and uh, it was a terrific opportunity to uh, get a chance to know the students. Uh, and we went away. Uh, there were other honors programs in the state of Ohio, so we would typically go to uh, state parks, and uh, we would spend a weekend getting to know the other honor students and the other universities. Do you do that now? There is like an honors retreat at the beginning of the year, as well as like there's like different opportunities to like meet other people, but it's like specifically in the University of Cincinnati honors, not like throughout Ohio. Okay, um, and tell me how you participate in honors today. Um, so with the honors program um, for the university, you have to meet certain requirements. Um, like every year you have to have an honors experience and that can be anything from like creating your own to um, like so if you go on a mission trip and you want to make it an honors experience like it's mainly about reflection mm -hmm. I would say um, and so like you experience it and then you reflect on it and then you present it and there are some that are what are some of the other ones um, I know like specifically for I went on like an um, it's called leadership yes and it's like an yes. honors retreat in um, the first week of winter break so that was a way, and that was also a way to like meet other students in the honors program. And there's also like, I guess I recently got accepted into the honors ambassadors. So you can go to like the gateway. Oh, you have to take a class called Gateway to University Honors, and that's like where you just learn more about the honors program as a whole, as well as you develop your learning portfolio. So we have like a website where we like showcase everything we've done. Through the what honors is program. honors ambassador? Um, it's kind of like. <clears throat> I guess just like a regular school ambassador, but specifically for the honors program. So like we help out at like the gateway classes, the different events. So we would like help lead like the, the honors retreat in the summer or like in the fall. And then we also help out just like the different honors events like throughout the year. Do you go to high schools to, as an ambassador? I don't believe we do. Uh, uh, how many honor, honor students are there today? Gosh, I have no idea. That's a good question. I, I'm, I'm betting that there's close to a thousand. I would guess that there is. I guess we can search that. <laughs> you can look that up. <laughs> That's a major technological change right there that you can, that you can <clears throat> just get those answers right away. Yeah. Well, while you're doing that, that's <clears throat> That's one of the things that come up in all classes, I hope now. Uh, certainly before I retired, I remember there were some questions the student asked that I couldn't answer, and somebody would look it up while we were sitting in class. So I think that's a tremendous aspect. And you guys are so good at that now. And then to go back, when you asked me about um, going to like office hours, I feel like a lot of my questions I can find like the answers on Blackboard, or I can like easily email one of my professors, so like just the whole like, technology yeah. is really but, did, but do you miss the fact that you're not interacting with them? I mean, <clears throat> one of the reasons that the students early on particularly would come in, what some I think unfairly called brown nosing, was that they were looking for a capacity to get letters of recommendation because an awful lot of biology majors 
in the first 20 years or so, the standard way to get into med school was to be a biology major. That's changed dramatically now. You can be an English major just as well as a biology. But at that point, everybody, Caduceia was a big pre-med society, and uh, people understood early on that you had to have the right kind of recommendations. So uh, I don't know whether you guys worry about that now. For my um, major specific classes, I feel like my biggest class has only been like maybe like 30 to 40 people. So it's like, I feel like I still get to know the professor just because of like the class sizes. Like being, I mean, I guess 30 to 40 is like kind of big, but like they're kind of like smaller. And like, since I'm a communication major, often the classes are very interactive. So like the teachers will ask us questions, or the professors will ask us questions. And like, we share like personal experiences. And I feel like I get to know the professors better. Like they get to know. Just yeah, well, things like public speaking. Mm -hmm. you know, like you know. Public speaking or like the interpersonal communication. You have to like talk about like your relationships. You kind of like you learn more about the professor as well as they you know. Well, and you both take special topics, honors, special topics classes mm -hmm. like this one. Mm -hmm. This is exactly right. I'm, I'm happy to say that we were the originators of that special topics honors class during the 74 to 77 period. And I think it's been a wonderful model. At that point when we originated it, there was no money available to give to uh, departments in order to encourage them to do it. But now it's a, not a minor amount of money yes. that is uh, encouraging students. Anyway, you have to take X number of honors classes, X number of experiences, yeah. and um, uh, it would be fun to figure out what percentage of students who are in the honors program actually graduate with honors. And, and I suspect it's substantially uh, less than the number of students who are actually in the program. Yeah, okay. Well, you have to get five experiences while you're in, um, in college. And it's like, but some, like, if you study abroad, that's like two experiences. So I think oh. it kind of like depends what you do. Because I feel like they are easier to get than you would think if you like. Because a lot of the things that like, like I guess a lot of different things that people are already doing can count as honors experiences. They just need to fill out the like form in order to like get it. Or like just, I know that like I have to take like two years of English. So like my second year of English counted, they offered it in like the honors program. So it was like easier to get experience. So I would wonder actually how many people graduate with honors. Do you have any idea how many special topics courses are being offered any given semester? I think it's probably around like maybe I I'm just guessing obviously but like maybe ten because there's like different um, <clears throat> like the study abroad ones so you like take a class for a semester and then you go like so one was like to Cuba I know my friends have gone to like Iceland so I think they offer at least five of those yeah a semester the study tour ones so, yeah oh. study tour so they go over like the first week of winter break or over spring break. <clears throat> Oh, I see. So it's not for an entire semester. No. It's only for a week. Mm -hmm. And you take the semester course beforehand yeah. about Iceland, presumably, yeah, and yeah, then so you go for a week. Well, that's pretty terrific. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a, a nice idea. Yeah. Are you both going to do it? Hopefully. I don't yeah, know, though. Because you have to pay, like, it's a certain amount of money. So it's, I know that the honors program does, like, um, offer, like, grants. So but it's like you might have to put your own. Just I did find a number for the honors program. For the 1516 process, they had 172 applications and 102 students were admitted. So about 100 for each incoming class, I guess. Wow. So that's much lower than I thought. That means there's only maybe 400 in the uh, in the program. Probably less when people like drop it once they get older if they mm -hmm. can't stay in the program. Yeah. Yes. There. There certainly there was a dropout rate that many years ago and probably drop out right now. But we didn't mind. The, uh, it was <clears throat> You could be in the honors program even if you didn't graduate with the accolade of honors. It was okay as long as you took advantage of what, what you felt was important for you. But uh, it sounds like there's an awful lot of good opportunity. <clears throat> you wonder why only 172, my gosh, uh, how many students? Aren't there something like 4,000 freshmen, at, at, uh, or, or at least five or 6,000 freshmen at UC? That sounds about right. 
So why only 172 of them? I mean, the the uh, requirements for getting in are not that uh, difficult. What 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 are they? Uh, 1200 SAT or 30? Um, yeah, it's a 3.2 GPA. Well, heavy. Yeah, it's heavy. Well, heck, these days, who doesn't have a 3.2 GPA in high school? <laughs> <clears throat> probably graduating from, from college even. Well, I'm wondering if like the numbers are, because you can be like, a, well, I guess, specific, like I'm a transition student, so I wasn't admitted my first semester of freshman year, but I like applied and like got accepted my second semester of freshman year, so I'm wondering if the number is higher, like just if you include the, the transition <clears throat> students instead of just like mm. the people who got accepted mm. directly. Yeah. Hmm. So we don't know uh, Rachel, of, of your 172, how many of those might have been yeah. transition students? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. I mean, that says that there's a fair amount of competition if they if they only take more or less one out of two. But. All right. So, so we're changing gears. But what interested you about um, botany, and then what made you go into genetics afterwards? Um. I was interested in botany mostly because of my parents. My dad was a horticultural uh, buff. He, he sold printing ink as, as a business, but he uh, loved uh, orchard kind of work. We had a two-acre piece of property in Clifton, and we had many uh, fruit trees and uh, grew a lot of uh, vegetables. So I grew up in that atmosphere, and I went to Ohio State in the College of Agriculture uh, to be a horticulturalist. And uh, it wasn't until my junior year that I took a course in genetics. And general genetics, just like that, I changed completely what I was interested in and uh, took e every single course in genetics that I could take at Ohio State. But remember now, this is 55 to 59, and in, in, in 1953, we learned from Watson and Crick that uh, DNA was the basis of, of heredity. And, you know, now you think of that, you learn this, this in the fifth grade. But um, it was only in my years in, in genetics I took in 57, but um, it was not known that much, anything about DNA, and we were just really trying to find out about the replication of it, the structure of it, and that kind of thing. Uh, so, uh, I was committed to genetics, and, and, and at least an example then of how my undergraduate career fundamentally changed my life, fundamentally. And one course did it. I couldn't get enough of genetics, and I loved the, the fact that the, it was strictly lecture then, of course, but the uh, instructor would give us all kinds of problem sets to take home and, and get the answers to, and then he would put the answers in the library. Now, of course, you get them online, uh, as I did but um, <clears throat> when I was teaching. But it was just a thrill for me to go into the library and look at all of the questions that I would answer and get my answers compare and when I it was almost more fun to miss it rather than to get it correct because I really oh what is this that I didn't understand and again at that time it was the, the faculty member was readily available at Ohio State and so I would often hey this number 14, I just don't understand how you got it. And what an excitement it was. I, it was learning at its best as far. And to this, to my entire 40 years, I wanted to do exactly the same thing with my biology classes. So putting problem sets uh, into uh, the system was a fundamental for me. It, it really was exciting. And do you have that in biology? Does, does Brian do that now? Um, I'm not in biology anymore. I only well, took one you, semester. Well, you took, yeah, you took the one semester. Um, yeah. Well, he did, let's see, he did the BRS questions, but he didn't do anything. Outside of class, problem sets? Yeah, not really. Hmm. Interesting. But you really liked the way he taught his class. I did. And why don't you describe a little bit of how 
do you know, Kate, how how Kinkle teaches biology 101, 2, and 3? Uh, I don't know. So what he does is he gives you um, a few sections of the textbook to read, and then you do these things called learning outcomes. So he has like his goals for what he wants to teach you for the day or for the class period. And so you would go through your textbook, and it wasn't mandatory to write them down or anything, but it really helps because when you went to class, you already knew. Like, if you had notes, then you like had the information in front of you already in your own words. So um, as soon as you would walk in, you'd sit down with your groups, and you'd take out your little PRS clicker, and you would put up like five questions on the board, and you would do those individually without your notes, and then he would go over the answers, and you could ask questions if you needed to. Um, and then he like went through some slides, and then he would occasionally throw in a question where we could do it with our groups, but you would still have to answer individually. And then um, he had these little scantron sheets, and he would give you a question to do with your group, and then um, you would like scratch off the answers, like A, B, C, D, or E. And if you like scratched it off and it wasn't the right answer, then you just had to keep on scratching it off until you found the right one. <laughs> but um, that would be like a group score, but you would get like, individual work and group work, and, like, a combination of both of them, and it was, it was just a lot of interaction between people, and it was a lot of fun, honestly. Probably more so than any other class you've taken. Yeah. Yeah. Biology wasn't my favorite subject, but it definitely made it yeah. like, fun to go to. So it, it's a great example of an interactive model, and I think he's using the technologic capabilities very nicely. He's giving you the assignments beforehand. Uh, I, I showed Blackboard as a part of yes. that, BRS, uh, an important part of it. And so he's lecturing a very small amount of time mm -hmm. during any given yeah. class period. Yeah, and I think that helps them because a lot of people zone out very easily so when you're interacting more it makes it easier to focus yeah do you get a sense Rachel that most students like it or would they just as soon sit back uh, be passive listen to a lecture I think some people would rather just have a lecture because it makes it easier to skip class but um, for the people who are in majors that are especially like competitive, like med school majors and people who want to go to pharmacy school or grad school, those places, um, I think they're more, they like it a lot more because they can learn more, I think. Um, that seems to be what I So, So you're suggesting that maybe the, the obviously the more motivated to learn, mm -hmm. the one that's yeah, more, like more interested in learning would like it. Mm -hmm. The one that's less interested in learning would just as soon sit back. But to that degree, to <clears throat> I would hope that it would encourage the lesser motivated to really get excited about that enough to where they might participate. Yeah. I yeah. think it also helps you remember it the information more. Like when you're done the class, you don't just like completely forget it. Yeah, it sticks in your mind. And then the learning outcomes help too because it wasn't just like you lecture. You get lectured in class, and then you have homework and then you're done with it. You have to like go through the textbook yourself, like learn the materials outside of class, put it in your yeah. own words. Yeah. Well, you see, that's very much the model that I was suggesting Barbara Wolver with her Shakespeare. He's wanting you to learn the material outside of class through a very variety of ways, Blackboard, his notes, uh, your textbook, mm -hmm. and then using the interactive model while in class. I took a couple education classes last semester and that was actually one of our biggest focuses was we I'm blanking on the name right now but like that's like one of the things we learned was like it works best if you give the um, students the material outside of classes have them learn it on their own and then in class you do the activities is it the flipped classroom yeah okay I did something like that in my high school classes too they would post videos yeah. online mm -hmm. and then yeah. you would learn it outside and then go back in and talk about it. it's called the flipped classroom yeah that's right well, is it a model that, uh, that historians are using more and more? Uh, to some extent. Um, I um, stopped lecturing in 2012. Um, I was a good lecturer, um, and it worked well for me for those five students who were paying attention. Yeah. Um, yeah. But... I was teaching a, 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 a intro to U.S. history class, and so the, those five students who were always in a class, who were paying attention, 
did well, and the rest of them looked bored to tears, and I was getting bored, you know, this is like, I don't know how many times I'd given some version of that lecture, and I, I, you know, and there was beginning to be much more emphasis on interactive learning, and I took one of the, you know, I went to a, a seminar after the end of the, uh, after the end of that school year, where we talked about how to do more interactive teaching. Um, I had already done some interactive teaching in some upper level classes that worked really well. Um, you know, so I had students assigned to to, um, to come to class prepared to their group would do the presentation or I would, we would interact and I would ask that group questions that they should know from having done the readings. Uh, and that seemed to work pretty well, especially for the upper level classes. Um, and I experimented with it a lot and you know, sometimes it seemed to work really well and other times you know, larger classes sometimes didn't work as well. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but I think we're certainly learning that that's a much better model for student learning yeah. than uh, the old model. Yeah. I, mean, uh, <clears throat> I remember back in the 60s and 70s, uh, we would use the old acetate where you would roll it on, on you have a, a uh, overhead projector and the acetate's there, and you write down the information that you're trying to get across, and the student would record it in the in their notebook, and that's the way the lecture went week after week, quarter after quarter, and such a tremendously different model now. I think we have progressed enormously. Yeah, I, I changed most of my my lectures, so I usually wrote out a narrative didn't necessarily follow it exactly. Um, and so when I switched to a more interactive model, I went in and re-edited those <coughs> narratives and then started posting them on Blackboard ahead of the class along with the, uh, the you know, reading assignments in the textbooks. Um, and I, I think that worked pretty well. So I, you know, I had moved pretty much to flipping the classroom that's good. And you're suggesting that a number of your colleagues in history, which I would have thought was probably one of the, the last places that might be. Well, there's still some of us, I, I think, who do um, at least part of their classes as straight-ahead lectures. Um, but we, I think especially the younger faculty have, um, I think, just yeah. our sort of interaction doing interactive classrooms is native to them. That's how they learned. Um, they understand the technology and feel really comfortable with it. So I think there's, you know, as more and more of, of our, we have more and more newer faculty, I think that's, that's really changing. So is this interactive model now the rule or the exception in your classes? Um, I feel like it depends yeah. because some of my classes seem to be more like a flipped classroom and others have been more just like actual lecture. Yeah. I have a marketing minor, so my two business classes I've taken, just because of like the sheer size of the class, I think it's like 275 to 400. It's been just like lecture, because I think with like that amount of people, it'd be hard to do like a flipped classroom, but it sounds like your biology professor was yeah. able to do that. And Ginkle's class is a couple hundred, isn't it? Yeah, it's in uh, Zimmer Auditorium, the big one, so it's at least and the same with my chemistry class, that one's a pretty good one too. Why did you take only one biology semester? Um, I only needed one credit. Uh, I wanted to go to pharmacy school after I graduate with my undergrad in chemistry, and I only need one credit of biology, so I just took one. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, so you're going for a, a farm D. Terrific. Well, you'll, you'll make a lot more money than faculty <laughs> members do so anyway. Uh, okay, good. Thanks for your interactions on that. I have one more question. Uh, so we have like uh, LAs and SIs, so like supplemental instruction and uh, 
learning assistants, I guess. And in biology, my freshman bio class, we had um, LAs that like walked around and helped us. They would help us answer questions or we could ask them stuff if we needed to. And then our SI tutors, they, um, I don't know if any of your classes have them, but. They don't, but I know okay. what you're talking about. Yeah, so they um, create like worksheets and stuff outside of the classroom. So my chemistry class does it a lot. And there are like three or four of them and they each have their individual sessions. So if you have a class during one of the sessions, you can go to a different one. And they just like go over the material that we went over in class. Mm -hmm. And they have them like two times a week. Was there anything like that? These are not connected with the lab, just with the lecture. Just with, with the lecture, the regular. Yeah. Um, no, okay. had nothing like that. In fact, we, we didn't have <coughs> TAs in our lecture classes at all. Uh, one of the negative aspects of teaching, in, in my opinion, at that point particularly, was all of the hours you spend grading exams. Uh, and without TAs, <laughs> that's, a, that's a real challenge, particularly in classes of 50 or 60. But no, we didn't have that, uh, Rachel. Um, and I, that sounds like an excellent uh, addition. But you haven't seen that in your classes. No, okay. but I also haven't taken any science classes, yeah. so I've been like, we haven't had anything. Like well, yeah, I mean, I, in theory, you could use that model outside yeah. of science. I haven't had anything like that for any of my classes, but I know a lot of my friends who have taken science classes like constantly like yeah. talk about how helpful it is to have that SI session. Yeah. It's just like an extra little like reinforcement of the material outside of class. Mm -hmm. For for um, large um, history intro courses, the model now is pretty much um, the the faculty member lectures twice a week, and then there are oh. then there are I think they call them recitation sessions, but yeah, yeah. with a graduate student, and and that's intended to do what sounds like what you're you're describing. So there's you know a small group with the graduate student and a place to you know interact and uh, ask questions and, and get a better idea. Of what and our chem classes have recitation sections too that we have to go to, so we get even more. Uh, again, no, oh, not with the lab component, with the... No, with uh, just the uh, just the lecture. Yeah. Well, that's terrific. And, and these SIs and LAs are presumably undergraduates as well as graduates? Yeah, so our recitation um, instructors are normally graduate students that have like, taken the classes before from our professors, but the LAs and SIs, they can be undergraduate students, and they normally have taken the class like the previous year. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I shouldn't have so cavalierly said no to your point about did we do that before because I actually remember a, a number of years where I um, had undergraduate students who had received A's in the course the previous year and, and asked them to be assistant TAs is what I called them. Uh, and what we did was give them one or two academic credits for uh, being uh, involved and it worked out beautifully so that yeah I mean I didn't do that in all classes I only did it in my genetics class but it worked quite well then. Okay. Well I guess to go back I guess backtracking to um, just like your more involvement at UC could you um, touch more on your like what you did as the associate dean in the um, College of Arts and Sciences? Uh, most of my role <coughs> as associate dean was to be the director of honors. I had an, an unbelievable title that I'm not sure I can repeat, but I think it was associate dean for educational innovations associate dean for educational innovations and director of honors. Um, the innovation in, t in education never got off the ground. I spent practically all of my time with the honors uh, program. Uh, <clears throat> at that time, we had only one associate dean. And at that, uh, I was the one and, and others before me and after me. Uh, now, of course, uh, the director of honors is a, is a promotional position, not a College of Arts and Sciences position. 
and there are many more associate deans in arts and sciences now than there were then. There's one for undergraduate education, one for graduate education, one for research, uh, but, but it wasn't at that point. When I was the uh, active, um, or one of, in the interim pro, uh, vice provost, it was with one of your colleagues here in history, Gene Lewis. Dr. Lewis was uh, provost of the university, and uh, there was an interim time for five months when I was his singular associate or uh, interim vice provost. There was only one. Uh, right now, I would bet there's probably eight or ten vice provosts within the office, and I happened to be on the website for the provost a few weeks ago, and I counted the number of staff that report to the provost, and there are 35. 30, if you go out on the provostial list now and you go under staff, you can count 35 individuals that are part of the provost, provostial office. And at that time, and that's not including Peter uh, Langford. And if we don't include Gene uh, Lewis, uh, myself and a business person were the only two that were in the provost office at that time. And that was in, in the 70s. So this is just talk about proliferation. And some of that has to do with being a state university. Uh, some of it has to do with a much larger size. Uh, and I don't know uh, what the rest of it is in terms of why we have 35 instead of two. But um, the faculty often lament that there's been a lot more. I mean, the faculty did not go from the equivalent of two to 35. That's whatever, you know, a 17% 17 times uh, increase. It would be interesting to see the number of faculty in the College of Arts and Sciences in 1970 versus 2016. I'll bet you that there's, it's, it's not even double. Uh, at that time, I would bet that we had maybe 350. And any guesses to how many ANS faculty there are now? I have no idea. Um, our department has fluctuated s significantly. Um, when Gene Lewis came in the late 50s, I think he said there were six history faculty. By 1970, I think we were into, into the mid-20s. And when I was here in graduate school, I think it was about the same. And then it dropped off substantially I think it dropped to as low as 15 full-time. <clears throat> um, and when Valerie Hardcastle became dean, um, she boosted our numbers back up to the low 20s. That was around 2000? Um, I think so. Well, no, I'm not sure. Um, I think she uh, was left the deanship around 2012. I think she'd only been in that position for maybe five or six years. Um, right now what's happened is that every, you know, for instance, I'm retiring at the end of this year. Um, I'm not being replaced by a full-time faculty member. They're going to patch my area together with adjuncts um, with some vague promises that sometime in the future they will you know, the dean and the provost will replace me full time. But uh, it's been very difficult in the last <clears throat> five years or so to get a new, to replace a full time faculty member or to even get a, a you know, a new budget line. Um, mm. And it depends yep. on the priorities of the dean and. Um, the provost's office. Yeah, sure. Well, so it sounds like there's some uh, commonality here. As I said, in 66, we had 11 or 12 faculty in biology. By early to mid 70s, partly because we were gearing up to be a state institution and getting state substantial increase in funding, we went to probably a couple of dozen. And I'll bet now there's maybe 28 or 29. 
so we have been a very steady, and you're in getting fluctuations, but yeah. you're not that much larger now with 45,000 students instead of 20,000. Mm -hmm. So there's just no question that the number of faculty have not kept up with the dramatic increase in uh, administrative positions. And some of that's good. Now there's a whole division in arts and sciences for advising. I don't know how many there are, but there must be four or five people, maybe a, maybe full time, yeah. advice uh, students, and probably for the for the good. But uh, I mentioned earlier that when I came in '66, for the for the next ten years, it was a model that faculty could be paid three or four hundred bucks a year more if they were willing to be the faculty advisor to 30 or 40 students. And the nicest part of that uh, was that every student was required every quarter to come in and get the uh, signature of the faculty member on what they were taking next quarter. Well, that was a great opportunity for interaction with the students, uh, but uh, that went by the board. and. And I probably rightly so, because some faculty were quite happy to take a few hundred more bucks, but they didn't give a damn about knowing the details of what what were all the requirements. So a student could come in and he'd say, oh, yeah, Joe, okay, oh, that looks good to me, get out of here. And, and then Joe would come, you know, in his senior year and say, I didn't take these three or four classes that are required for me to graduate, and it was a heck of a mess. But now we've got really professional advisors. So that was another dramatic change. And I think over the time, the administration did understand, hey, the faculty just aren't doing it in terms of, of advising. And I actually even have a few advisors because I have my, again, like arts and sciences chemistry advisor. I have my honors advisor and I have my pre-professional advisor. So I've got a bunch of them. Pre-professional, pre-farm yes. advisor. And you have, yeah, okay, uh, you have a, bar, a, a chemistry advisor, um, kind of a randomly chosen faculty member or someone who's um, dedicated to that? It's like in the um, like McBicken advising offices, I guess, but it's just a randomly chosen one from that. Hmm. Okay. Well, in, in biology, I'm happy to say that maybe 15 years ago now, we uh, went to a model where we hired a, a, a faculty member who also taught, but her job was to be the biology major advisor. So she would see the hundred or so majors every year uh, and work with them uh, on and making sure that they did what they needed to do. And I think we do have, um, his name was Dr. Bruce Alden. Sure, yeah. result, sure. He did the, he was involved with the chemistry program and I think he was like the advisor for the whole chemistry program maybe, which might be similar to what you were talking about, but. Um, yeah, but Bruce is a much more accomplished yeah. faculty member, you yes. know, he's a fellow of the graduate school and all kinds of things, so yeah. this, he, he doesn't spend anywhere near the time that Mary Fox uh, spent uh, as a advisor okay. for students. Because I did go to him a few times and just make sure, like, ask him about my courses and what I should be taking for like the rest of my few years. Um, and he said it looked all good, but he did tell us that we could come in and ask him about advising questions if we needed to, so, along with our other big, big advisors. Okay, good. I also have like, I think three or four. I have like my honors advisor, I make like, an advisor, Communication yeah. advisor and then like a co-op advisor. Yeah. So. And and what do you guys do with the uh, honors advisor? What how do they advise? What my experience with my honors advisor is, I do, we had to meet with them our freshman year mm -hmm. and just kind of like I think she, they just wanted to like get a, get to know us more. So they I talked about like the courses I'm taking, like what brought me to UC, kind of like basic questions. And I think now they're there for like if we have questions about like our learning portfolio, like the um, just general questions about the honors program, I think like the different um, 
experiences we have to get. So I think they're like, but I don't think we're required to meet with them. No, we're not. But mine did sort of the same thing, and she also like offered me. She said, um, "Well, what kind of like work are you interested mm -hmm. in? What kind of experiences do you want to have?" And I told her what I was like, what I wanted to do, and she said, like she wrote me down a list and said, mm -hmm. "Here are some of the things that you could possibly do." That's, and then um, I like said like the different things I was involved in and my honors advisor was like, oh, you could turn this into an honors experience if you wanted to. So I think they're kind of just like helping you. I think they're probably just helping us make sure that like we do graduate with honors and we're not just like. Are, are these honors um, staff mm -hmm. that are, so how many are there now? I mean, do you know how many staff people sure. are in the honors I mean, program? Say like, I, I'm just kidding. Probably like at least ten, yeah. because I know they also they're not not only advisors, but they also teach the gateway classes, and some of them I think teach like actual like classes through the honors program, mm -hmm. and I know like specifically like Ashley Weber is in charge of like the leadership program, and I think. But they're they are they are members of the honors program. They're not uh, a faculty member in another department. Yeah, they're just like specifically in the honors program. Yeah. Well, that's terrific. And again, honors in the 70s was the director and a part-time uh, administrative assistant, and that was it. We didn't have any. So all of the advising was done by the director of the program. But but you uh, had 60 or 80 compared to 400. Well, that's great. You, so you both feel very good about your opportunities through the honors program. Yeah. I really, I enjoy it. I wasn't, I mean, um, yeah, I like. By the way, do we, did either of you go to Turner's or Schneider's to be in the honors dorm? I see it's Turner's. Yeah. Turner's is the honors dorm. Um, I lived in Turner just because, like, I posted on the Facebook page and I found roommates that way, which is another way of how technology has kind of, like, changed the university experience. But um, I lived in the honors dorm, but I wasn't in honors when I oh. started. But then really? I. Really? Mm -hmm. huh. So you got into the honors dorm without being, I didn't realize that was possible. Well, two of my three roommates were in the honors program, so I think that's. Now, did you stay for your second, are you now in Turner's? No, I live in an apartment, but um, yeah. But I don't feel like, because I wasn't in honors my first semester, I like felt like it like affected me at all in the dorm. We just had like, I guess, a nicer dorm. Yeah, okay. Uh, so that's another nice opportunity. You you live at home? I lived in Morgan's Hall last year. I lived on like, the 12th floor last year, and then this year I live on the 9th floor. Morgan's. It's Mor oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Morgan's. <laughs> oh, that's a wonderful new yeah, facility. Yeah. 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 One of the great things that you see, most other institutions, I guess, did as well, uh, Oh, 25 years ago, we started this concept of helping hands. Helping hands, you had it when you moved in to Morgan's or to Turner's. Faculty and staff volunteer during the couple of days, three days that you're allowed to move in in the fall semester. And so we get to help move you in. So we all have our t-shirts on and we stand out there with our carts and we, your parents drive you up. You guys don't <laughs> you oh, never yeah. heard of this. We actually well, we have like um I guess just students who like um oh, you, students do it yeah, as well. You can move in I think like two or three days early and then you help like move the other students. Oh so it sounds like what you guys did is just like what students Yeah, do yeah, yeah. Our students were always around as well. But it was a great opportunity to get to uh, meet some faculty members and the provost would be out there doing it, a lot of the administrative personnel. So, it, and it, it still, they do it every year. And anyway, uh, the nice part is, I got, over the years, I got to be a helping hand in every single uh, dorm in, in uh, UC. And I would have said that, uh, well, the ones, Morgan's and uh, Sayota are only a couple of years old, yeah. but I, I thought those were probably number one. Uh, but then Turner and Schneider, mm -hmm. Schneider, I guess is the is the one for athletes. Uh, but they are they are very nice modular units. I mean, and then you go to Calhoun, and oh my God, Calhoun <laughs> is just a mess to get into. 
Yeah, no, Dabney, I think, still has, like, um, they don't have, like, air conditioning. They have, like, this space. The little units. Yeah, the units. So. Well, my mom was, she lived in Callahan, and during the orientation when we stayed and either sit on the Callahan, she showed me her room in Callahan. And um, Didn't we change. spent one night there, and she said, it's literally the same thing. And I was like, I'm not living here. <laughs> so um, ah. I actually spent a lot of time in Turner because a lot of my friends through the honors program lived in Turner. Sure. So I was over there a lot, and they came to Morgan's a lot. Um, Did you consider staying there as a sophomore or wanted to get out? Um, I don't know. I liked Turner, but Morgan's has the kitchens. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually brought two of my friends that lived in Turner last year over to Morgan's to live with me this year. Um, and they like it, too. But I like Morgan's a lot, and that's why I lived there for this second year. Yeah, that's good. I know that there are some honor students who say the second year in Turner's as well because it's such a good program or such a good place to, mm -hmm. to live. Yeah, one of my roommates from last year when we lived in Turner is now like an RA in Turner because like, she really liked living. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Huh. Good, good. By the way, do either of you work for pay? Um, I work at a movie theater, but not like... You movie work theater. at a... A movie theater in Blue Ash. A movie theater in Blue Ash. Mm -hmm. And just chicken kind of things? Um, I'm a server there. They like serve food. So that's what I do. I'm a huh. And you, one of you is at Floyd's. Yep. Yeah, I'm, you're at mm -hmm. Floyd's. Yeah. And so how often do you work? Um, well, last semester I worked Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. But this semester my classes changed, so I just work on Friday. But I also work at Skyline Chili in Mason. So. Mm. How many hours a week do you work typically? Um, it kind of depends on the week, but normally I probably, I think I work like, like six to ten hours a week. Okay, six to ten. No more than that for you? Um, it depends. If I work, I normally work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday if I do like all four of the days, but um, I just cut it back to two, so it's normally like, I think like about ten hours, maybe twelve per weekend. Okay. Well, I would say that that's another big difference then versus now. I don't think the students had near the commitment to outside jobs that they do now. I would guess the typical student today might be working 20 to 30 hours a week, and I don't recall students working anywhere near that uh, in the 60s and 70s. I know some of my friends work like 40 hours a week like, and while also going to school. It's yeah, it, it's, it's crazy and it clearly impacts on, on the education they can see. So I would encourage you both, don't work more than 10 hours a week. Yeah. That 10 hours you can absorb, but more than that it begins to really affect you. Mm -hmm. You're going to get the chance to work all the rest of your life. You don't have to push it now. <laughs> So how are we doing? Um, Pretty well. Just check in. Do you guys have some more questions? Or? I think we hit all of them. I think we did hit all of them. Okay. Do you have any like, other things you want to add? Like, well, I want to ask questions? you, what are you? What are the next steps? What What do you now do with this? And how are you kind of summarizing all of this good stuff? Well, hopefully good stuff uh, for uh, for the course. What What What's down the road? We've got 10 more weeks, eight more weeks. Mm -hmm. So what, what will you be doing next? Have you finished all of your, have your fellow students finished all of your? Uh, um, David Lee Smith is out of town, so uh, that group is going to um, interview him, I think, next Thursday or Friday. And then the following Wednesday class will discuss the interviews, uh, I've assigned them to uh, each of the students to at least index the interview. So at, you know, three minutes and 30 seconds, from Dr. Huthers talked about, you know, okay. um, if the class was larger, I would have required uh, an actual transcript of the interview, uh, but there's just, we don't, that's very, Time consuming and absolutely we don't have you know the the, the number of students in each team to do that right. um, 
Why don't you tell them about what we did last week? Um, is that the genealogy? Okay, we went to the Cincinnati Public Library and we did, I guess we researched you on Ancestry.com. Really? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> good. Yes. What'd you find? Um, we found your junior and senior yearbooks from Ohio State. We found um, both of your parents' gravestones. We found your father's um, draft registration card. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow, good for you. <laughs> you. You should send him what you did. It's very interesting. They, all of the groups did a wonderful job I, and, and actually exceeded my expectations. And, and you, you used Ancestry.com? Mm -hmm. Good. We found your, um, from the 1940 census and the 1931 uh, when your parents lived on Ohio Avenue. And then we found that you have a sister. And that your mom's mom or your grandma lived with you. Yes. Did you find <laughs> out that my grandfather was a tailor? We did not. Did not. Okay. It was kind of hard because. Um, your father's name was the same one as yours. Yeah. So it was like difficult to distinguish like who was who, and so we had to look at dates and yeah. make sure that we were looking at the right things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it did kind of mess things up. My parents called me Junior. I mean, yeah. I was Carl A. Huther Junior, but they didn't like this little Carl, big Carl kind of thing. You know, when someone would, is Carl there, well, which one do you want? So they nicknamed me through my middle name of Albert, they, that's how I got the name Bert. Okay. So next week we're going to um, go to um, a f uh, downtown firm called Gray and Pape that does, it's their cultural resource managers, which means that they, um, probably their biggest um, business is when there is a a construction project that's funded with federal money, they have to go, they have to look at what kind of historic cultural resources may be impacted. Um, so for instance, um, with plans for the new I-75 bridge, they have had to study the corridor where that bridge is going to go what, what are the historic buildings? Are there any uh, graveyards that are going to be uh, disturbed? Uh, they did the, um, uh, an analysis of Washington Park before Washington Park was completely rehabbed. And I think one of the things they're going to talk about, they've also done a lot of work on uh, Music Hall, and they'll talk about how they did that work. Uh, but this, so partly to introduce them to that kind of work in general, but also um, I want them to um, learn how to research the history of a building. So for instance, um, you know, the, the place that you lived with your parents on Ohio Avenue, what did that building look like? What can we learn about that building? What can we learn about the neighborhood around it. So, to, so the idea would be to place you in this, you and your family in this neighborhood, um, and maybe follow, you know, follow you. You know, your parents lived on Ohio Avenue at one point, and then they lived somewhere else, and then you came back after being away in college. Where did you, where did you and your wife live? What does that say about, uh, you know, what were the demographics of that neighborhood? What did that house look like? So partly to, to teach the technique and also to put you in a wider perspective, not just who you are and what you did, but who, who would you have interacted in your, with in your neighborhoods? Um, and did that change over time or, or you know, were, um, you know, we learned that uh, Jean Lewis um, at one point lived on Woodside Place, which is, you know, in a, in a building that's no longer there. He lived in Amberley Village for a while. When he was a, a, a brand new assistant professor, he shared an apartment out in the west side of town. 
And so this all tells us something about who you are and what the environment was that you lived in. Good. So partly, partly to build a more robust biography of each of you, but also to teach that technique. Yeah. May I ask then, will these students potentially become interviewers for the legacy project that we've envisioned? I, I haven't talked about that that much, um, but the, uh, the, um, the plan is to, this course is kind of a pilot for developing a, um, a, 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 an oral history project with retired faculty in general. Um, we're figuring out, you know, we're using you as guinea pigs to try to figure out how best to do that. Uh, but the idea would be that um, sometime in the very near future we would have um, st students who are trained in doing oral histories and would assign them to additional um, uh, retired faculty. We need to talk about how we're going to you know, make that happen. Um, but that's, you know, one of the options might be that students from this class because you've had the training uh, we might you know if we can find funding we might hire you um, you know for a few hours a semester to do additional oral histories with with additional faculty so to put that in the in the perspective that's how this course came about um, the Ameritai Association Board uh, was interested in the oral history concept. Uh, there are a number of other institutions of higher ed around the country that are having these kinds of oral histories and I think it's increasingly clear that they have something to offer. Uh, our College of Medicine to its credit has been doing it for a number of years and in fact they have in the archives some of their work. Uh, I, I looked at one uh, with uh, Dean Daniels and they interviewed him regarding the con kinds of changes that occurred during his deanship. Well, this is a good part of history mm -hmm. and um, it's increasingly obvious to professional organizations. My own human genetic society understood that we are we were losing some of the really big names in human genetics because they were they were old and they were dying and we wanted to have oral histories from them as to how they saw the perspective of change over a 20 or 30 or 40 year period so it was on that basis that we all got together and started talking about it and, and uh, we came up you came up with this great idea of having this course but but it is ultimately with the intent of being able to use you because we we didn't know how to get interviewers and how to have them be good interviewers what the college of medicine does is just go to daniels and says hey who would you like to be your interviewer and so it's another colleague with whom he's comfortable and that guy just kind of dialogues with him well i think probably this kind of thing is a your training is a lot better than what a colleague might do. So we're still trying to figure out how, how to do all of this, but um, you know, hopefully, you know, we will uh, we'll figure out the next steps, and then we'll you know we'll be contacting you all, and if you know if you're interested in continuing to, to do some of the oral histories, and I think we would probably try to match um, the faculty member with a student who had perhaps similar interests um, so you know um, you know someone you might interview someone from communications or English at least some connection and um, you know perhaps we would have someone um, who had gone through the pharmacy school you know had been you know pharmacy faculty and, and had to interview them yeah or frankly Bruce Holt would be an excellent example. This guy has been a, a significant doer 
at the University of Cincinnati. He's been involved in an awful lot of good things, mm -hmm. and it would be great to get some good oral history. Yeah. And he's a nice guy. Yeah, he is a nice guy. In fact, if you continue the course next year, Alt would be one to uh, encourage uh, interviewing. Okay. Well, um, why don't we uh, stop here? And, uh, great.